Hello, Paul Hamler here. Welcome back to Paul Hamler's YouTube channel. Today we're going to do a, a little video. I titled it the five S's, standing for saws, sparks, sawdust, scrapers, and shavings. We'll try to get them all in there. What brought this on, those of you who follow my uh, Instagram, Hamler269, I posted a picture uh, that you see in front of you now. This is uh, a s selection of eight different materials that I'm going through evaluating, deciding which will go on to the production models of the guns. Uh, we might just use a couple of them, we might use one of each. Uh, but what I want to share with you today was a process that I went through in prepping the wood and get them, getting them sized and one side flattened and getting them prepped for the CNC for milling the, the profile and the shape of the handles. The first thing we're going to do is go in and take a look on the bandsaw and show you a couple of techniques in there on the bandsaw for slabbing and rough slabbing these things out. The remainder of the video we'll be talking about some scrapers and, and different type scrapers and scraper concepts. And with that, let's go take a look at the bandsaw. We're going to be using the old trusty uh, Walker Turner antique 14 inch bandsaw for this operation. And uh, one of the things I wanted to point out to you that uh, in order for this operation where I want to do some really fine ripping or precision ripping on the bandsaw, uh, I'm using what's called a wood miser bandsaw blade. We'll take a close up in a minute here and show you the, the profile of the bandsaw blade and tell you a little bit more about it. But first, just to give you a, an overview of what this blade's capable of doing. We're going to lay this thing out. Using our flat, half flat pencil and a piece of sixteenth of an inch uh, steel, we're going to mark off the line that we want. There's a picture of the pencil that's been cut in half. It gives you a little crisper line and more accurate to the size that you want. So with that, we're going to try to rip this and one of the things I want to point out to you is the finish that you get with this wood miser. One of the things about this uh, wood miser is the uh, is a teeth configuration in it. You don't see this on your normal uh, bandsaw blade. What they've what they've done they've staggered the, the uh, gullet or the tooth size in a random, well it's, it's uh, repetitive, but what you've got is you've got a, underneath the, the red marks you've got a wide gullet and then the green is one a little bit smaller and then the black in the middle is a smaller yet. These blades are uh, half inch wide, they're carbon magnesium spring steel and uh, they say they're twice the tensile strength of commercial half inch bandsaw blades and they're much harder. And this is one of the things that we're going to talk about in the remaining of the video is steel and hardness as it applies to scraper blades. But uh, the, I, I'm, not, I'm not associated with Highland Hardware in any way. It's just a, a product that I use, have used for years. I strongly believe in it. And, uh, I, I certainly suggest it. Now, what we're going to do for the slabs on the gun here is we're going to take this piece of rosewood here and we're going to do the same thing, same thing that we did laying out the little test piece. 
we'll put the uh, half inch bar down there and mark it put another one on top of it mark it and now we've got our, our two pencil lines the next thing we do is take the take the stock and uh, two side tape it to this one two three is actually a one two four block with two sided tape and uh, it gives you a little bit uh, a better feel and uh, more protection it, particularly if you got a block of wood that's not square on the bottom so what we're going to do is just uh, saw a slab off of this and then we'll take it in and we'll demonstrate some of the scraper techniques that I was speaking of Obviously, there are some mansaw cuts visible on this slab, but they're considerably smoother and less than using a conventional mansaw blade. So let's take these in and uh, and scrape them and talk a little bit about scrapers. Uh, before we start scraping the uh, piece of rosewood that we just band sawed off. I want to try to make a little point here and uh, for a lack of a better thing we're going to call it thinking outside of the box. You notice the box I got my little buddy in there we'll take him out of the box so he can think better and uh, we're gonna let him make a decision for us here. Uh, his name is uh, Wilson not Watson but Wilson and uh, sometimes he responds when I talk to him. Sometimes I have to holler at him. But anyways, what we've got here is a piece of aluminum tubing uh, there. And we want to cut that off. We want to cut a length of it off. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask Wilson, Wilson here which saw I would use. And... Uh, should I use this saw here? Normally he shakes his head when he is in affirmative. So no head shake. Wilson, should I use this saw here? I'm going to ask you again one time. Should I use this saw? <whistles> ooh, ooh, hello, talk to me. Oh, maybe I have to push his belly. Hey, Wilson, should I use this saw here? Ooh. Oh, that looks like an affirmative. Okay, so we're going to saw off this piece of aluminum over here. Just go back in your box. You're making too much noise. Okay, we're going to saw off this piece of aluminum with this hand saw. Hey, that sounds like a challenge. First time ever saw this happen in a hardware store, I thought the guy didn't know what he was doing. However, what we have here a Distin 342 handsaw. And if you look off to the right of the Distin logo, it says for cutting metal trim. Now the point being, the metal in this handsaw, I can assure you, is a little bit different than the metal in a, in a normal rip saw or a crosscut saw, along with the, the way it's filed or sharpened. So just kind of uh, 
try to make a point here is what we're going to be looking at is some different types of materials to make scrapers out of. Uh, the uh, traditional scrapers that most woodworkers are accustomed to are what we refer to as the card scrapers. And I'll put a few out here on the table and we'll take a look at them. Let me, what, what I refer to as traditional scrapers, card scrapers. We have uh, a scraper insert back there. These materials uh, are, are traditionally a 1095, a 1075 spring steel. And uh, most all of these uh, scrapers like this have to be sharpened by filing, stoning, and turning the burr, and then returning the burr. It's, uh, it's not an easy task. Uh, there are some woodworkers that never seem to master it and get past the point where they'll make shavings. So uh, the scraper 1095 is traditionally what's used again in the, in the card scrapes. But what I'd like to show you today and make you aware of is these metal working cutters that are commonly referred to as uh, slitting saws. What's unique about them, uh, they're all made out of high speed steel. And just about every one, there will be a marking on it that says HSS. You'll never guess what that stands for. Okay, you figured it out. High speed steel. Okay. If you pick one of these blades up, you can barely see it. It says HSS, high speed steel. Typically, they're used on a horizontal and can be used on a vertical mill for slitting or cutting small slices or thin cursing metal or slotting screw heads. If you pick one of these up and flex it, or try to flex it, first of all, it just feels different than uh, your traditional card scraper. They are brittle. Uh, they will break. Here was a rather large one that, uh, that I stepped on on purpose to try to break it. And uh, they'll, they're a little bit like glass. They will they don't have the spring in them that your typical 1095, uh, 1075 steel does. The advantage of them, once you get a burr on them and get them cutting, they will outlast a traditional card scrape, I don't know, 10, 15 times before you ever have to resharpen them. They, they hold their edge quite a while. So, and I'll show you how to sharpen them. And the, the ease of sharpening them is really uh, a lot simpler than sharpening uh, a card file. These things come in different thicknesses. Uh, some of them come up, I don't know, a quarter inch or better. My recommendation, uh, these are some four inch ones. They come in different diameters, so whatever you're comfortable holding with, or whatever you got in the scrap pile, or whatever you can borrow from your buddy's next door neighbor's machine shop. Uh, if they're free, they're, they're even more uh, desirable. But uh, the uh, high speed steel is totally different composition than your 1095 spring seal. Let me try to demonstrate that by uh, looking at the grinder here. We'll try to do it with, uh, with the light on. If you can't see it, we'll cut the light off. Uh, typically a selection criteria I've used in the past for spring steel uh, is a spark pattern. If you've got a very robust pattern, if you hold it up to the grinding wheel, kind of a yellow, uh, here's a, a section of a card scrape. Some of the old hand saws have considerably more sparks, but you notice the spark pattern on the uh, 1095 was kind of yellow and it had sparks trailing off at the end in the starburst. Now, let's look at a piece of high speed steel. And the first piece of high speed steel we're gonna look at is a typical uh, cutter blank that would go in a lathe bit. Uh, 
Notice the difference in the spark pattern. First of all, it's kind of an orange color versus a real bright yellow. Kind of orange, not quite as sparkly and robust as the 1095. Now, here's a uh, high speed steel uh, 25 thousandths slitting saw blade. Not as yellow, not as robust. Uh, let me show you how easy it is to sharpen one of these. Okay, that guy is now sharpened and ready to use. And we'll demonstrate it here, but the first thing I want to uh, mention, in order to sharpen these, when it comes off the stone, you can, with your fingers, you can feel a burr. Uh, on each side of where you sharpen it. Now, you can sharpen these at any profile you want. Here's one where I've gone around and put a half inch uh, concave radius and a, a half an inch uh, uh, convex radius. And uh, you can sharpen them in any custom shape or profile you want. If you want to break these up into smaller pieces so that you can hold them uh, in individual holders, uh, like I have here. These are little, uh, they're used uh, for holding small segments of rulers. Uh, it's like this guy here has a stair makes these, a uh, uh, brown and sharp, etc. But this has got a little ruler in it with graduations on it so you can use it to go, you know, inside of something that you're, you're measuring. Uh, but you can also there's a homemade one there. They're not, they're not that hard to make. But the, uh, <clears throat> the advantage of how quick they are to sharpen, there's one prerequisite that you really have to focus on. I told you to feel the, uh, the back side here, after, or the two sides of it after you uh, take it off the grinder. You should feel a burr on each side, on each edge, that is pretty equal. It's a lot of times you'll feel one on one side and not on the other. And the, the way that comes about, when you sharpen this guy, what you have to do is adjust the stand that the blade is sitting on. This has to be adjusted so that it is exactly on the center line of the shaft or the motor. So if you draw an imaginary line through the center of the shaft, center of the wheel, out to here, they need to be pretty close. And the reason for that is uh, when you come in with the blade, you want this guy to be grinding on the, t if it's right at the six o'clock, I'm sorry, at the three o'clock or the nine o'clock position here, you're going to be equally cutting off the top edge and the bottom edge at the same time. Now, that applies, the height of this applies for one thickness of, of blade. If you've got a thicker blade, you're going to have to adjust this up or down to get the center of this touching the stone. So you need to be aware of that if you sharpen, say, a, a 20 thousandths and you move over to a 60 thousandths, that 60 thousandths is, is not going to be riding on the center like the, uh, the thinner one. So with that, Let's see if we can get the camera set up here and I'll demonstrate the one that we just sharpened. Okay, a piece of rosewood here. Uh, this, this is a traditional card scraping in the 212. When you're scraping, 
with a 112 or a 212 or a chair scrape what you want to focus on is keep a smooth rhythm you don't push and stop push and stop you want to start your cut your scrape and go all the way through just follow through occasionally you'll get a really stubborn piece of wood curly maple or, or whatever and as you're coming through it'll, it'll hit a knot or, or a stubborn part and it'll slow down and give you some resistance and you'll come on through and finish your scrape this is usually associated when you're using a thicker blade I prefer thinner blades, 25, 35 thousandths. This has got about a 25 thousandths blade in it. Uh, the thicker blades don't work. They just offer me too much resistance. A uh, little trick learned years ago, curly maple, if you got one that's just giving you some stubborn headaches, put a little rubbing, a little rubbing alcohol on there. Not gonna hurt anything but it sure does increase the, the flow and the efficiency of the scraping operation. Just put a little alcohol there. Okay, this guy, let's put this blonde, blonde piece of wood here where you can see the, the shavings coming off uh, onto the, the blonde material there. Now you remember we just sharpened this guy. This guy here, we just sharpened him on the flat, haven't done anything to it, come right off the grinder. This is called a shaving, not sawdust. Okay, it's just that simple to sharpen one of these. Now, I kind of think of scrapers, uh, you can look at them in uh, as sandpaper, uh, you can get them in different grits. If I was to sharpen this high speed steel insert over here on this side with the coarse wheel, the little burrs and the uh, uh, shavings that's turned up on the edge are going to be a little bit coarser. So I can make a, a lot coarser scrape by going, going to the different, uh, the coarser stone. Or if I go over to the white stone, I get a smoother grind the uh the burrs that's raised up on either side are not as aggressive so it's a little a little nicer scrape now if you want a really fine scrape what you do is get you a diamond stone this is a three i think it's a three thousand yeah that's a three thousand uh i use these for sharpening my engraving tools but you can also take one of these and, and this this is a razor blade holder. That's all the world is. You can a single lid. You can pop this guy and slide the blade out. So it, once you grind away, and you can do it on the grinder or whatever. But once you get the cutting edge away, and now you've got a 90 degree uh, edge on there, you can come in with this this diamond and uh, and put a make a really let's call it a 400 or 600 grit scraper. And what I'll do to demonstrate it, we'll put some lines on this little piece of butter board here. And we'll come in here. Not nearly as aggressive, but it is scraping. These these are this that's not sawdust. Those are those are scaled down shavings that's coming off of the burr. Now a razor blade is obviously not 1095 spring steel. It's it's more attuned to the high speed steel. It's harder. Another material that's really good for baking scrapers, Home Depot, uh, Lowe's. You can buy these uh, carpet blades. There's a type of cutter that goes in here. And just feeling these things and trying to flex it, you can tell right away it's it's it doesn't have the, the spring and the give that a card scraper does. It's, it's just a, a little bit harder, not quite as hard as the high speed steel, but uh, if this one has been sharpened enough, I'm trying to keep this in the focus of the camera. There we go. A lot of gun makers I know use these. Uh, but the, the edge over here, 
was put on here exactly like this. Just bumped it right into the stone and moved it back and forth. And if you feel, you've got equal burrs on each side of that, that edge. Uh, I don't know if you guys noticed, I did a video on this little fixture here. It's got a, a different configuration on the back. But one of the problems I kept running into is this red phenolic material. The wood would keep slipping. You'd have to hold it down. This material here, I'm uh, not really sure what it is. It's, uh, it's got an adhesive backing on the back of it. And it's made to go on stairs or slippery uh, tiles and stuff like that. And all I did was tape that, you know, with a peeled it off and taped it down and it's actually uh, it holds up pretty good it, it gets you in a situation where if you want to plane a, a small part you see how it's holding it and it's not not slipping around uh, I wish I knew where I got that but in, in about a hundred years ago uh, I'll move the camera over to uh, the mill here and show you a setup that I've got over there, which is effective for sharpening these carpet blades. Well, you can sharpen anything on it, really. But if you <coughs> if you don't have a bench grinder, uh, check out this alternative that I have over on the mill. Okay, what we've got here is a round, circular, diamond impregnated disc. Uh, Steve Lindsay sells these. This particular one here is it's a little coarse for the particular operation here, but it's a 100, uh, typically a 200. If, you, if I was going to buy two of these discs, I'd go with a 200 and a 600. Of course, they go all the way up to four or five thousands. Uh, but what, uh, what we're going to do here is uh, sharpen a, a razor blade. Now, with this setup, it's a little more straightforward. You don't have to worry about uh, any height adjustments unless you're sharpening engraving cutters and then you want that set a half inch above uh, for your fixture. So let's see if this uh, one of this sharpening works. The, f the first thing I'm checking after I bring it off to sharper is do that finger check to see that the burrs are pretty much equal on each side which they are so let's give this guy a try now again because of the size of the razor blade and uh, your, your burr it's not quite as aggressive. It's a, it's a scraper. And uh, what I found on these razor, single edge razor blades, when you turn them and put that little burr on each side, uh, they work extremely well on uh, hard material. They will scrape ivory, mother of pearl. Here's a piece of stabilized wood. Uh, and this stuff is it's, it's impregnated with epoxy. Uh, if, you sh if you sharpen this on a, uh, a finer grit diamond, say like a, a 600, and get those little burrs that get raised up uh, a lot finer. Uh, it's almost like hitting it with 600 sandpaper. If you want to cut these guys into sections and and uh, break them off, use your your Dremel cutoff wheel. But if you'll keep it lubricated, either with the bow lube, uh, which we talked about in, I think it was a casting video. The bow lube works extremely well. Another cheaper alternative is beeswax. So as you're using, just load up, load up your cutoff wheel. 
put the beeswax before you start going to the metal. And usually if you look where you're cutting the slot, you'll see wax, the, the uh, beeswax melting and flowing out on the side of the gap. And when it stops flowing out, just touch it to your beeswax, load your wheel back up with the, the beeswax lubricant. And uh, it will keep this cutoff wheel from grinding away and eventually just completely wearing down to nothing. You'll be able to cut you know, 10, 12 times longer with a, a well lubricated uh, cutoff wheel, either the bow lube or the, uh, I think Johnson makes a, a stick and a tube that they use on band salsa. So anything to keep the temperature of that wheel down and keep it lubricated will will give you a lot longer uh, life on cutting these things. Now, do a little cleanup here. A uh, couple of things. I did a video, I don't know, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we were, were doing the uh, uh, etching the logo into one of the Lincoln and Raven axes. And, uh, uh, I had forgot to take my meds that day, so I, I was I was leaving a lot of stuff out and overlooked some things. I got a few questions on it, and uh, one of the guys wanted to know if I made my own silk screen uh, templates, and I said nope. Uh, so some things that you can farm out and get done a lot more efficient and cheaper than going through the whole learning curve. Now I have made t-shirt silk screens years ago, but this is some pretty fine material. So what I do is there's a company out in California by the name of Marking Methods. Now, it's not the only company, but Marking Methods, uh, if you send them the artwork, like I sent them this uh, uh, artwork of, of Lincoln there, and uh, you tell them what size you want them to shrink your artwork down, they will make you, I think they send you six of them. Uh, in this case, I sized them down to the what you see there on the little silk screen. And uh, it's not that expensive, uh, I don't know, under $100, but the point is you get six of these silk screen templates from them and uh, you can get four, I don't know, two or 300 uh, burns out of each one. Uh, here's another company, I think this was a company that made the uh, etching machine uh, that broke on me when I was doing the, the demo. and. Uh, I'm going to do a, uh, here in the future, I'm going to try to do a lot of real short five to ten minute videos. Uh, you know, get different guys have different names of what they call their tips and techniques and all, but what, what I'm going to do is uh, I've got a long list of just little neat stuff that I feel like, you know, there's some people that would be interested in it. Uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reburn and etch the logo on one of those five minute videos where you can see the difference between an etching uh, and a marking. Now, I uh, had a couple of questions about the, uh, the, the mylar when I was showing the, uh, the sequence and the process of how to make the uh, continuous belts for the, the little setting blocks that my vendor still hasn't finished. Uh, but I was splicing these things along with the, the rubber wheel. I was splicing them using the mylar that came uh, on this uh, 3M uh, sanding paper. Of course, you use the backside, uh, use super glue. Uh, and a good friend of mine, uh, just absolutely uh, genius wizard, uh, probably one of the best and smartest engravers in the world by the name of Jim Small, lives over there in Madison, Georgia, I think. Jim's always coming up with a better idea. Uh, and uh, I was looking at some of his sanding belts, and lo and behold, I said, that looks like transparency. He said it is. So any type of transparency that's used in an inkjet printer uh, appears to be a, a mylar or it glues up real well. Here's uh, this mylar has been super glued to the uh, cloth shop roll. And then I found uh, some material here in the shop and I don't know, all I know is the guy that gave it to me was uh, a draftsman so he did a lot before CAD. He did a lot of uh, uh, drawings 
and gave me a lot of tracing paper and other materials that he had used after he retired. And one of the, one of the pa in the package, one of the things that he gave me was some, I don't know, 10 and a half by 11 sheets of this material here. And it appears to be mylar as well because it glues extremely well. It's very strong. And uh, I asked him what he what they used it for. And uh, the way he described it to me was, if I if I draw some artwork, I basically use it like a, a more rugged uh, tracing paper. So I drill the back of it and I lay it down here on this piece of pine and I go draw back over the top of it that my lid just draw right over the line and like magic it transfers it uh, so you can do it for doing mirror images for engravings wood carvings etc uh, got any knowledgeable draftsman from the old school out there that knows what they call it give it give me a comment and let me know so because people might be wanting to know about it uh, one last thing again uh, when we were talking about the wood miser bandsaw blades I kept saying Highland hardware well it used to be Highland hardware it's now called Highland woodworking and uh, the uh, This is one of their mail-out catalogs. Highland Woodworking. Okay, this is a company. They're in Atlanta, Georgia. This is a company that uh, makes the wood miser or sells the wood miser bandsaw blades that we used at the first of the video. Uh, the diamond wheels uh, and the flat uh, stones can be procured from uh, Steve Lindsay at Lindsay Engraving. Uh, he's a good friend of mine. If you tell him you know me, he'll give you a 60, 75, maybe 90% discount. I'm kidding about that. Anyway, uh, one other catalog that I find interesting is uh, a company out in California, uh, Stuart McDonald. Basically, they they service uh, you know the guitar, the guitar industry. Stuart McDonald, Stuart Mac, uh, they sell a I think it's about a quarter inch thick high speed steel. Actually, I think it's made out of W two, but they they make a, a W two steel. A uh, thick scraper. It's got a flat bottom and a curves on the top. Uh, a little pricey, but uh, it's uh, it's a pretty nice tool. The uh, I think, as they say in the YouTube industry, that's a wrap. Unless I get over here and sit out and think of something else. But uh, anyway, uh, keep your eye out looking for the. Uh, the little five minute segments I think they'll be from five to ten minutes just gonna be a little quickie because I'm always working in the shop and I'm doing something and I say god this is a you know I've done this for years I wonder if so-and-so knows about it so we'll have a series of those coming out so for the five S's which uh, as I remember was the uh, saws sparks sawdust scrapers and shavings I think we covered all of those. I hope you enjoyed it, uh, and we'll catch you next time.